Even playing field isn't always the most realistic goal. While matching against other players that pair with your skill nicely can be a real treat, it's tough to conjure that up in just an average multiplayer match with your pals. From this stems the idea of party game design. Centering around how to make these games fair through the wackiness and ultimately give the less experienced players a fair shake. The concepts needed for this genre can differ greatly from what we typically associate with the competitive side of gaming. So that's why today, I think we should take a look at seven different party game designs that account for the unbalances, and through an aspect of randomness, manage to keep these games always feeling fresh. Hey all you party animals, I'm Skip the Tutorial, and this is Game Bites, an appreciation anthology of the best bits of design that gaming has to offer. And hey, if this is your first time here, then pop a party popper on that subscribe for weekly insights into your favorite things about gaming. Super Mario Party's Allies Mario Party definitely shines through when there are multiple players on the board. Recent games have definitely tapped into this fact too. Maybe not so much with the car, but rather with the addition of ally characters helping you out on your journey for the stars. While this mechanic does root back to the Toad Scramble mode in Mario Party Star Rush for the 3DS, I think the wider breadth of characters in the Switch's Super Mario Party makes it the definitive example for this mechanic. The reason for this is that the mechanic centers around the idea that, as you're moving around the board, you'll land on various spaces to call upon a randomly selected ally to help you out. After scoring a new buddy, they will then lend their particular die for you to select in your movement, and then go even further by adding some additional roll points to your main die. Right off the bat, this makes exploring through the maps a much faster paced experience, since your partner will juice you up each turn. Worth noting here is that this develops a nice amount of extra strategy to each roll, since you'll have to switch between plotting out your optimal space, picking the right die on your end for the potential 1 out of 6 chance to get there, and then hope that your teammate comes through instead of undershooting you straight to a red space. Partner with the ability to snag multiple allies at once, and the game opens up the red carpet for you to start flying around the map and lets all the exciting events dial up to 11 on their frequency. When this is all put together, this mechanic really allows players to pick up the pace on their movement strategy, and also gives a nice pace keeper to some of the slugs in your player group, keeping the game at a blissful speed. Super Smash Bros. Final Smash Finishing moves in fighting games are awesome. I don't think I'm really breaking any new ground there. These special attacks are just a lot of fun. The Smash Bros. series is no different on this front, with the Final Smash system fittingly taking its place in the finisher roster. For those who haven't been lucky enough to dish one of these out, or unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end, are these extreme powerhouses that can be used to wreck through the opposition under different conditions for each character. Now, on top of just being impressive showcases of the whole dev team's hard work and insane animation log, these attacks also play key roles in shifting the whole tide of the battle. I mean, if you're playing as Bayonetta in Smash 4, yeah, enjoy that new instant KO you just found. While it's easy to get lost up in the fancy graphics and fantastical impacts of these attacks, I think where they really shine from a multiplayer sense is on the way you snag one of these power-ups, the Smash Ball. Anyone who's played a match locally with one of your pals with items on knows the sheer madness that can stem from when one of these little guys spawns in. All of a sudden, it becomes a bloodbath as you and your opponents trip over one another trying to snag the finishing move. The punch to win requirements on the item further emphasize that aspect, since every player will be dishing out as much of their damage as possible while on the chase. And as soon as one of you grabs it, then that player drops into standby mode and emanates a rainbow color, making them a clear target for the other players to attack and score back the smash ball. This old concept drives for so much of the game's hectic design, and serves to create some of the match's most memorable moments. This all comes together to create a final attack that's easy on the eyes, lethal on the draw, and all in all, makes casually playing with items a blast. Rocket League's Ball Cam Few games can make sure that everyone's equally bad, and yet they can still have a great time. Rocket League does a fantastic job of this through its crazed soccer ball with cars model. The clear disconnect between the speed of controls and the small frantic target creates some magnificent moments of gameplay that really keep the stakes high throughout the entire match. But one quick look at the free cam mode of the game's controls shows that it can be pretty tough to keep on track on what's going on within the game, especially in multiplayer modes such as split screen. To fix this, the game implements a genius quality of life feature in the form of its ball cam perspective. This simple shift allows so much more of the game's tempo to revolve around the ball than if the players were just left to their own devices, as the camera whips and pans around real time to adjust for your target. From this, you're always sure to be driving with clear awareness of the ball's shifting location. This allows for so many of the crazy trick shots the game is synonymous with to play out full force. One thing I really want to stress here with the brilliance of this mechanic is how it provides a frame of logic for newcomers. Since the core game stays fast paced with the various boosts and bumps with other cars, it can be difficult to latch onto any form of spatial awareness when you first start playing, and given the open tools to react live to the ball's positioning cannot be understated. This point of view goes to show how just a seemingly simple shift to a game's quality of life design can play such a huge role in its accessibility to the masses, and really gives Rocket League the juice necessary to share such an iconic experience with friends. Crawl Slime Spirits 
Powerhuff's 2014 Arcade Asymmetric Multiplayer Classic and Crawl is one of the most excitingly paced multiplayer experiences to date. One of the reasons I think it deserves this title is in how the game employs a set of little design choices to constantly keep players on the move. Chief among these in my mind is the game's slime spirit system. As the non-dungeoneer ghost players move around the rooms the main player, they'll be able to collect various amounts of randomly generated ectoplasm, a material all too important for taking back your humanity. Collecting up to a base total of three slimes, you can eventually spawn in a set of these little guys to possess and distract the hero character. Now, while these might not be the most important damaging of your followers to use in the game, their role as a distraction can really turn a match around to your favor. Since a player cannot leave the room until every single enemy is defeated, you can essentially keep them locked in a room through a steady stream of your slime minions, so long as you and the other ghosts pick up some more ectoplasm in the meantime. This is just one of the examples of the ways your slimes can completely switch the pace of the game. You can also spawn these goo monsters in as a supplement while the hero fights other, more demanding monsters. Although their damage is small by itself, Partnering them up with a wave of baddies for the other player to fight can really play in diminishing down their health. With those aside, what's probably my favorite implementation of this ectoplasm system lies in the shop scenes. Here, these rooms are kept for the player's discretion, and they can effectively keep the whole gang inside while they sort out the shopping list. Whereas this might be a pace imbalance in other titles, Crawl System comes together to fix this, since you and the other ghosts can stockpile your slime reserve to maximum capacity. And any hero who doesn't want to deal with that reality now is forced to book it out of the store before you can fully prepare. This really plays into the game's key understanding of multiplayer pacing, and does a great job of making sure each player always has some goal to work towards, even if it's not obviously in front of them. Tower Falls Looping Screen Positioning in multiplayer games can be tough. Designing for this aspect is a must. Thankfully, the good folks in the development for this one included the feature of looping screens within the map design. Having some experience playing this title will immediately point out how clever this feature is since it drives the warring players into a satisfyingly confined arena that further emphasizes the mad experiences from the limited arrow focused combat. Evoking other iconic designs in gaming, such as how Pac-Man circles back on the board when you venture too far to the right or left, this mechanic allows players to develop a different perspective on spatial awareness as they fold back and forth within the confines of the map. Partner with other design aspects, such as the ability to stomp on your foe's head for a kill, or shoot one of your arrows through these same loops, and the game opens up the potential for you to design a mind-bending chain of attacks and maneuvers that sets you up for a choreographed victory. Other small tidbits for the design cycles in the map include the immediacy of the gateways, allowing for split-second kills that can only be done justice in the replay, as well as how these gateways can be blocked through the game's various hazards, allowing for reshapes in the map to reconsider on the fly. Taking all this into consideration, as well as the idea that this allows a new and more forgiving form of aiming for less experienced players, and the design here really rises out no matter how many times you cycle back on it. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's smart steering. I'm convinced that no matter what continent, country, or even culture you belong to, if someone offers up a couple of races of Mario Kart, you're gonna say yes. It's just that universal. Defined for its party game nature, the series historically features multiple mechanics that allow for less skilled players to still have a fighting chance. Most prominently, the variable item box distribution of abilities, as slagging behind will net you some rare goodies, but with an early lead, all you can score is pocket change. Heck, even Lakitu's caught some serious helicopter parenting habits, not even letting you drive in reverse in more recent Mario Kart titles. But to me, one of the most compelling bits of accessibility added in my Mario Kart 8's Deluxe Edition was the inclusion of smart steering. Indicated by a flashy yellow antenna springing right up from your back bumper, this mode does exactly what it says on the tin, and provides an extra helping hand for staying on track to racers that might need it. And while at face value, this seems like a pretty harmless handicap option, this mechanic did catch some flack for auto-defaulting to on, but I would argue that this is the best way to implement the feature. Tucking it away in one of the game's option menus, or leaving it off at the same spot in the car customization screen would have defeated the point. Making it opt-out ensures that players who need it have it on, but more experienced and familiar racers have full range to play with their own skill. In fact, true racers are encouraged to switch it off since certain shortcuts and optimal strategies are blocked by the smart steering mode. In short, if you want to build some distance in your races, you're going to have to take off the training wheels. But as a whole, I find it pretty wholesome that I'm able to share one of gaming's greatest experiences with my kid sisters without having to explain the concept of losing when Lakita sports them that final DQ. ARMS' Party Matchup System Riding high off the October reveal of the system, Nintendo had a lot of hype going for them when they ran the Switch's January presentation. During their trailer showcase, one particularly springy Rock'em Sock'em style game stuck out amongst the rest. Debuting later that same year, ARMS sprung into the fighting genre with a new wave of exciting mechanics that juiced up the gameplay to some crazy heights. With a colorful cast with some amazing breadth in their designs, 
Each match you played felt like a mix of electricity being shot straight to your controller and your eyeballs, creating a great environment for multiplayer experiences. And while you could just lean the traditional fighting game competitive ladder, I believe the real online intrigue was the game's party match system. Entering into a room, you and a small group of other boxers are each represented by a character portrait. Pretty standard stuff. However, it's how the game sets up these matches with these character heads that really sticks out to me. Taking different combinations of characters and thrusting their bubbles into various matchups, the mode wastes no time pairing up face-offs. From here, you and a number of the other fighters in the lobby will go into various team or free-for-all challenges. But say you didn't make the cut. The party mode screen keeps you engaged through charmingly simplified demonstrations of the ongoing game's real time. While this can just be written off as fun visual stimulus while you wait, it also serves to show you key details about the winning and losing streaks of your fellow members, which is crucial information when the game rewards free rush gauges to struggling players, but might cap the HP of someone getting a little too big for their britches. Having a constant idea of the amount of coins that certain players have built up gives incentive for concepts very reminiscent of more traditional couch multiplayer gameplay, like how you and your pals might team up against that one friend and knock them off their high horse. Partnered with the ability to drop in and out of the mode at your discretion, the whole experience provides for an excitingly fun and snappy environment to just loosen up the old spaghetti noodles. Hey there, celebrate on this one up in the top right for the 7 sneaky secrets developers interweave into their games. Or eat some cake down in the bottom right for another video. If you want to support the channel and get new insights every week, then throw a bash on that subscribe button to stay in the loop for the conversation. But until then, take care, and you have a good one alright?